What happens to the health of our colons within just two weeks after switching from a standard American diet to one centered around plants? That was Dr. Michael Greger, a world-renowned physician and author of How Not to Die cookbook. Colon cancer is a serious health concern, but what if you could significantly reduce your risk through the power of food? In this video, we'll be joining Dr. Greger to explore the most effective dietary weapon against colon cancer. Dr. Greger isn't just a medical expert. He's a leading voice in evidence-based nutrition, empowering you too. Take control of your health through smart food choices. Today, we're diving deep into the science of colon cancer prevention, uncovering the dietary patterns that can tip the scales in your favor. Get ready to learn how your gut microbiome, the trillions of bacteria residing in your intestines, plays a crucial role in colon health. Dr. Greger will unveil the surprising link between diet and gut bacteria, revealing how specific foods can nurture the good bacteria and starve the bad, potentially reducing your risk of colon cancer. This video will equip you with a powerful dietary roadmap packed with delicious and effective strategies to combat colon cancer. Let's listen to Dr. Greger. We have 100 trillion microorganisms residing in our gut give or take a few trillion, but the spread of the Western lifestyle has been accompanied by microbial changes, which may be contributing to our epidemics of chronic disease. So how did things get this way? The problem is that we're eating these meat-sweet diets characterized by a high intake of animal products and sugars, processed foods, and a low intake of whole plant foods. Contrary to the fermentation of the carbohydrates that make it down to our colon, uh, the fiber and resistant starch that benefit us through the generation of those magical short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, microbial protein fermentation, when excess protein is consumed, that generates potentially toxic and pro-carcinogenic metabolites involved in colorectal cancer. And so what we eat can cause an imbalance in our gut microbiome and potentially create a recipe for colorectal cancer. What can we do about it? Where a high-fat, high-meat, high-processed food diet tips the scale towards dysbiosis in colorectal cancer, whereas a high-fiber and starch, lower-meat diet can pull you back into symbiosis with your friendly flora and away from cancer. What medicines can we take? We now have evidence from interventional studies suggesting that adopting a plant-based, minimally processed, high-fiber diet may rapidly reverse the effects of meat-based diets on the gut microbiome. So what might be a new form of personalized microbiome medicine for chronic disease? It's called food which can rapidly and reproducibly alter the human gut microbiome, switch people between a whole food plant-based diet and more of an animal food-based diet, and you can see dramatic shifts within two days, which can result in toxic metabolites. Switch people to an animal food-based diet, and levels of uh, deoxycholic acid go up, which is a secondary bile acid known to promote DNA damage and liver cancers. Why do levels go up? because the bad bacteria producing the stuff triple in just two days. And over time, the richness of the microbial diversity in our gut is disappearing. Here's our bacterial tree of life that's getting depleted. Do we know why this is happening? Why is this happening? The fiber gap. A low-fiber diet is a key driver of microbiome depletion. Yeah, there's antibiotics and cesarean sections and indoor plumbing, but the only factor that has been empirically demonstrated to be important is a diet low in max, not Big Macs, microbiota accessible carbohydrates, which is just a fancy name for fiber found in whole plant foods and resistant starch found mostly in beans, peas, lentils, and whole grains. Our intake of dietary fiber, our intake of whole plant foods, is negligibly low in the Western world when compared to what we evolved to eat over millions of years. Uh, such a low-fiber diet provides insufficient nutrients for our gut microbes, uh, leading not only to the loss of bacterial diversity and richness, but also to the reduction in the production of those beneficial fermentation end products that they make with the fiber. Uh, we are, in effect, starving 
our microbial self. So it sounds like we need to eat more fiber, which is actually a type of carbohydrate. Here are the top foods with the highest fiber content per ounce. 1.chia seeds, approximately 10.6 grams of fiber per ounce. 2. Flax seeds, about 8 grams of fiber per ounce. 3. Hemp seeds, around 2 grams of fiber per ounce. For pumpkin seeds, roughly 1.1 grams of fiber per ounce. 5. Almonds, about 3.5 grams of fiber per ounce. 6. Sunflower seeds, approximately 3 grams of fiber per ounce. 7. Pistachios, around 3 grams of fiber per ounce. 8. Pecans, about 2.7 grams of fiber per ounce. 9. Lentils cooked, roughly 3.9 grams of fiber per ounce. 10. Black beans cooked, about, about 5, 5 grams, grams of, of fiber per ounce. Dr. Greger. What are we going to do about the deleterious consequences of a diet deficient in whole plant foods? Create newfangled functional foods, of course, and supplements and drugs, prebiotics, probiotics, symbiotics. Think how much money there is to be made. Or we could just eat the way our bodies were meant to eat. What kind of value is that going to get for your stockholders, though? Don't you know probiotic pills may be the next big source of big pharma billions? Why eat healthy, though, when you can just have someone else eat healthy for you and then get a fecal transplant from a vegan? Researchers compared the microbiomes of vegans versus omnivores and found that vegans' friendly flora were churning out more of the good stuff, showing that a plant-based diet may result in more beneficial metabolites in the bloodstream and less of the bad stuff, like TMAO. But while the impact of a vegan diet and what the bacteria were making was large, the effect of the composition of the gut microbiome was surprisingly modest. They only found slight differences between the gut microbiomes of omnivores versus vegans. That was a shocker to the researchers. I mean, this very modest difference juxtaposed against the significantly enhanced dietary consumption of fermentable plant foods. I mean, the vegans were eating nearly twice the fiber. Anyone see the problem here? The vegans just barely made the minimum daily intake of fiber. Why? Because Oreos are vegan. Cocoa Pebbles are vegans, french fries, coke, potato chips. There are vegan Doritos and Pop-Tarts. You can eat a terrible vegan diet. Burkett showed that you need to get at least 50 grams a day of fiber for colon cancer prevention. That's only half of what our bodies were designed to get. We evolved getting about 100 grams a day. And that's what you see in modern populations that are immune to epidemic colorectal cancer. So what if instead of feeding people a vegan diet, you just fed people that kind of diet, a diet centered around whole plant foods? OK, so it's not just about being vegan. It's about eating more healthy foods with fiber. But how do we know this isn't just genetic? Colon cancer is our second leading cancer killer. But some places, like rural Africa, have more than 10 times lower rates than we do. Um, the reason we know it's not genetic is that migrant studies, such as those in Japanese Hawaiians, have demonstrated that it only takes one generation for the immigrant population to assume the colon cancer incidence of the host Western population. Now, the change in diet is considered most probably responsible for this, but there's all sorts of changes when you move from one culture to another, like smoking rates, different exposures to chemicals, infections, antibiotics. You don't know if it's the diet until you put it to the test. What is the evidence that we have for the benefit of plant-based diets? This international group of researchers were trying to figure out why colon cancer rates were an order of magnitude higher here in African Americans and Caucasians than in rural Africa. Well, if you look at American colons, they're a mess. Polyps, diverticulosa, not to mention hemorrhoids, whereas the African colons were remarkably pristine and more importantly, sevenfold lower colonic epithelial proliferation rates, a characteristic of precancerous conditions. They measured everything that they were eating and concluded that the higher colorectal cancer risk and proliferation rates were most closely associated with higher dietary intakes of animal products. 
which may have led to higher colonic populations of these potentially toxic acid and bile salt producing bacteria, but you don't know until you put it to the test. Higher rates are associated with higher animal protein and animal fat, and lower fiber consumption, more of those bad bile acids, less of those good short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, and that higher mucosal proliferation. But how do we know it's the diet that's mucking things up? You don't know until you perform an interventional study. How about we just swap their diets? Feed the Americans a high-fiber African-style diet, and those poor Africans get the sad, standard American diet, like sausage and white flour pancakes for breakfast, a burger and fries for lunch, and like some meatloaf and white rice for supper. That was day one for the rural Africans in the experiment, whereas the Americans were forced to eat fruits and vegetables, corn and beans. To help with compliance, they threw in more familiar foods like veggie dogs, though note it was not a vegan diet, just generally plant-based. And the food exchanges weren't for like years, but just two weeks. Could they see changes that fast? The dietary changes resulted in remarkable reciprocal changes in the lining of their colons in terms of cancer risk and their microbiome. Switching to plant-based boosted the fiber fermentation and suppressed the carcinogenic bile acid synthesis. Uh, let's look at some before and after pictures. They took biopsies, and this is the colon lining of an African American under a microscope. Those brown dots mark dividing cells. Uh, their colon lining was in overdrive, the cells rapidly dividing, a sign of pre-malignancy, a risk factor for cancer. But just two weeks eating a healthier diet, and their colons calmed right down. The African Africans started out with some proliferation, but it got worse on the American diet. This is a different marker measuring inflammation. Each of the brown dots here represents an inflammatory cell, so rife inflammation before calmed way down after just two weeks, and the opposite in those eating worse. We know that when our friendly flora ferment fiber, they produce beneficial compounds like butyrate, which is anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer. Well, impressively, Africanization of the diet more than doubled butyrate production, whereas westernization cut it in half. In terms of toxic metabolites, a significant drop in the healthier diet, whereas the meat loafy diet increased the levels of these carcinogens by 400% within just two weeks. And so what's the takeaway? So bottom line, no point intended, uh, what they were able to show is that just by changing the food, you can remarkably change your risk. In fact, that's how the lead investigator put it. Change your diet, change your cancer risk. It may be never too late to start eating healthier. Based on these kind of data, adopting a whole food vegan or even just near vegan diet rich in fruits and vegetables along with other healthy lifestyle decisions could have a stunningly positive impact on the cancer risk not only of black Americans but of all peoples. While it might be unrealistic to expect rapid and profound lifestyle changes in the general population, hey, at least we have sound, effective advice to offer to those who make the choice to take the steps needed to optimize their healthful longevity. Remember, your health is the lock, and we're here to provide the keys. Keep turning to Key Health for insights that unlock your full potential. The key to lifelong vitality is in your hands, it's just one bite away.